What's up, everybody? Uh, back with another Bible study. This is a continuation of the Hebrews Bible study we began the other day. We've already been through Hebrews 1 through 6, and there's 7 through 13 left. So we're either going to do this in one study or two studies. I'm not sure yet. I'll let God lead me on that. But we're going to begin in Hebrews 7. But before we get started, let me preach the gospel. Everyone is going to stand before God for judgment one day. Anyone who hasn't received forgiveness of sins and been made right with God is going to be judged and thrown into the lake of fire for the second death, a body and soul, destroyed forever. God requires perfection in order to inherit eternal life, in order to be with Him in His kingdom. None of us are perfect. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. There's nothing we can do to earn a right standing with God, and that's why Jesus came. Jesus came 2,000 years ago, born as a human, faced temptation just like us, but lived a perfect life. And although He was perfect, didn't deserve any punishment. The death that we deserve in a lake of fire for our sins, he died for us on a cross. So that through him, that death is taken away from us and we receive eternal life. Through him, our sin is taken away and we receive his perfection and he lived out. Repent and believe the gospel. The word repent means to have a change of heart or change of mind. To truly turn to God. To give your life to him. To make the choice to follow Jesus. If you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose three days later and through his sacrifice is offering you eternal life. If you turn to him and ask him to forgive you and you truly mean it, he will forgive you, he will give you the Holy Spirit and he will give you eternal life. The Holy Spirit changes your heart and leads you to follow him. The Holy Spirit gives you wisdom, discernment, power and many things. But if you truly believe and you truly turn to God and ask him for forgiveness, he'll forgive you, he'll give you the Holy Spirit, and he will give you eternal life. The Bible says we can't even imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. Can't even imagine it. Repent and believe the gospel. Give your life to Jesus today. And man, as soon as I started this video, a ton of traffic just started coming by. I just, I'm just out of this little... Uh, pull-off spot near my house but you know I've been sitting here for about 30 40 minutes and barely had any cars come by and then I started the video and it's like con consecutive is what it is though no not gonna bother me although it is Intentional, most likely. I don't believe in a lot of coincidences, and I am a target. They do stuff like that to disrupt me, to harass me. But it is what it is. Hallelujah. Now, here in Hebrews 7, we're going to get started with Melchizedek. And if we go back to Genesis, uh, once Abraham... So Abraham, first off, Lot, the Abraham's nephew, was taken. Um, and Abraham went, went to go get Lot. He took three, 300 men from his own house, from his own household, his own uh, people. And they went and defeated, uh, I can't, I got to review this. I can't remember exactly who, who they defeated. Uh, but, they, but there was a battle between... It's known as the Battle of the Kings. And Abraham came back from the Battle of the Kings with Lot. And with uh, you know, some of the spo spoils of war. And he gave to Melchizedek, who was supposedly the priest of Salem. And that's where Jerusalem comes from, Salem. I believe Melchizedek was actually Jesus uh, a form of Jesus in the Old Testament. Based on what we see here in Hebrews 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, king of Jerusalem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils. So that was the beginning. That's the first tithe. 
technically. To whom Abraham apportioned a tenth of all the spoils. So he gave him a tenth of everything he uh, got from the one from the battle. Was first of all, by translation of his name, speaking about Melchizedek, king of righteousness. And then also, king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days or end of life, but made like the Son of God. Speaking about Melchizedek, he remains a priest perpetually. So I believe here in Hebrews 7, the writer of Hebrews is telling us Melchizedek was Jesus in the Old Testament. It says he remains a priest perpetually, having no beginning of days or end of life. This was Jesus in the Old Testament as this priest who Abraham tithes to. Hallelujah. Our king of Salem and also um, the priest. And man, this traffic. It's crazy, man. Glory to God. Glory in the persecutions. Hallelujah. Now observe. <laughs> and another one. Now observe, like they're doing. That's exactly what they're doing. Now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office had the command in the law to collect a tenth from the people. This is really unbelievable. Like how many cars are coming by here now? It's crazy. Like I've had like 20 cars. Like I was here 30, 30 to 40 minutes at least. Probably closer to 40 minutes before I started this video. I had maybe five cars pass by the whole time. And I've, I've only been doing this video for like five minutes. Um, maybe a couple more. Maybe a little bit more. And I've had like at least 20 cars pass by. Like it's crazy. But I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to stay focused on the video. It's just, uh, you know, harassment. It's gang stalking. That's what it is. Research and learn what gang stalking is. But also there's a lot of disinformation out there. From the enemy. And those indeed are the sons of Levi who receive the priest's office. Have the commandment and the law to collect a tenth from the people. That is, from their brethren. All these are, although these are descended from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy, speaking about Melchizedek, is not traced. From them collected a tenth from Abraham. And blessed the one who had the promises. So Abraham had already received the promise of God. At that point. To be, um, his descendants would be a, greater than the sand of the sea. Greater than the stars in the sky. But without dispute, but without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In this case, mortal men receive tithes. But in that case, and so, so I, I mean, again, I believe with the rest of this. What I'm about to read is it's referring to Jesus, Jesus in the Old Testament. He was Melchizedek. He was the angel of the Lord. He was the word of the Lord who came to the prophets. He was the, you know, the angel of God and the angel of the Lord in the burning bush. He was, he's all throughout the Old Testament and people don't realize. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. But without any dispute, the lesser is uh, the lesser <laughs> the lesser is blessed by the greater. In this case, mortal men receive tithes. In this case, meaning the the Levites receive tithes tithes from the Israelites, ten percent. 
In this case, mortal men receive tithes. But in that case, one who receives them, speaking about Melchizedek, but in, but in that case, one receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. This is Jesus as Melchizedek. And so, and so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, his grandfather. For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not designated according to the order of Aaron? So, the Bible says Jesus is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And he, and he was Melchizedek. But, um, so he's not according to the order of Aaron. According to the order of the Levites. So, perfection isn't through the Levitical priesthood. See, none of us are perfect. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. We can't earn a right standing with God. We can't earn eternal life. None of us are perfect. That's not possible to the Levit Levitical system. So Jesus came uh, as a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And it's through him that we receive eternal life. And not that we don't obey the laws, and we're going to get to that in a second. Uh, although many were more specifically for that time back then. We still obey, but it's through, you know, we, we know it's through faith. It's through, through, by grace, through faith. And that's, and we receive the perfection of God. We receive the perfection of God, the perfection of Jesus. Because he fulfilled the righteousness of God by living a perfect life. None of us can live that perfect life. Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of the law, for on the basis of it, the people received the law. What further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek? And not be designated according to the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed... Of a necessity, there also takes takes place a change of law also. And so, that word change in Hebrew or in Greek uh, also means transfer. When the priesthood was changed from the priesthood of the Le Levitical priesthood to the Melchizedek priesthood back to Jesus... There's a change uh, or transfer of law. And so we do still obey the Levitical laws, although many don't apply to us now. And if, and if we go to a, Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48, we see that this same law, the, Levi the Levitical law, is still in place. And that animal sacrifices are going to be uh, made during the millennial millennial reign in the order of Melchizedek and as I said the the word also means transfer change means transfer so let me just read this again it says for when the priesthood is transferred from Levitical priesthood to the Melchizedek priesthood there takes place a transfer of law also For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing about. 
<laughs> For it is evident, evident that our Lord, and I'm just laughing at a pop up. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing about concerning concerning priests. And this is clearer still. If another priest, priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the... And actually, let me, let me just read this again. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing about concerning priests. So, you know, Jesus was of the tribe of Judah, that's still of Israel, but it was the Levites that were priests. And this is clearer still, if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, Melchizedek, <clears throat> who has become such not on the basis of a, of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of in, according to the power of an indestructible life. So, in other words, in other words, what this is saying, Jesus came from the line of Judah. The priests were only from the line of Levi. Jesus is our high priest. He's not according to the Levitical priesthood. He's according. He uh, comes in the Melchizedek priesthood, not from the tribe of Judah, or not from the tribe of Levi, but the tribe of Judah. And this is what it's saying here. It says, uh, "This is clearer still if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such." This is speaking about Jesus, who has become such not on the basis of a law of physical requirements, but according to the power of an indestructible an indestructible life. So not the physical requirement. Speaking about uh let me just actually let me just click on the footnote here. Okay, the footnote says fleshly commandment to be a descendant of Levi that's the physical requirement so that's what it's saying at, and I just wanted to confirm with that footnote there it says who has become such who has become a priest of Melchizedek who has become such not on the basis of a law of physical requirement or descendant of Levi but according to the power of an indestructible life eternal life just as it was with Melchizedek it said no had no Genealogy, no beginning of days or end of days, which I believe that was Jesus in the Old Testament. But Jesus comes as a according to the order of Melchizedek. So let's continue on with this. It says, For it is attested of him, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because is because of its weak, weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope, through which we draw near to God. And so, so what this is saying is, you know, the former commandment. This is the old covenant. The old covenant covenant was to. I mean, it's always been about faith, but it's. It was to obey God, obey these commandments, and you will live. And not that it's that different now, but that's not how we're saved. It's, we're saved through faith. And the, the point of this scripture, what it's saying right here, is that when it says, setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness, that's because... The law can't save us. Or, and, and more specifically, you know, if, if we were able to keep the law uh, perfectly, we would have eternal life through our actions. But nobody is perfect. None of us are perfect. None of us can fill the, fulfill the righteousness of God. And that's why Jesus came. 
For on one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of of us weakness and uselessness. In other words, you know the the old covenant trying to earn. I mean, although it was it's always been about faith. Um, it's uh it's not because of our keeping commandments that we can receive life it's because of our faith it's because of a better hope and that doesn't mean we don't keep commandments now we de- definitely do keep keep commandments now but we but we realize that it's not keeping the commandments that saves us it's faith in Jesus and he saves us for on the one hand there's a setting aside of a former commandment because of his weakness and uselessness for the law made nothing perfect and so is the law weak because we weren't able to be perfected by it no the law isn't weak we are weak we are weak we are not flawless and like I said if we were able to keep the law perfectly we wouldn't need a savior but God made it, made it to where we need a savior he made it to where the law made nothing perfect. And we have a better hope. Because we can't earn our way to heaven. Because we all break the law. And through faith, we receive the righteousness of God, which is His perfection. That He lived out. Jesus lived a perfect life. He kept every law perfectly. And we receive that. We have that righteousness imputed to us through faith. And that's how we're made right with God. But it's not through us. It's not, And it's not the law that's weak. But it's us that's weak. And they can't keep the law perfectly. And actually this part... Um, verse 19 is actually in parentheses. Where it says... For the law made nothing perfect. But... Uh, back from verse 18 again for on one hand there's a setting aside of a, of a former commandment because of his weakness and, weakness and uselessness and that's basically our weakness and, and uselessness because we can't keep God's commandments perfectly and be right with God for the law made nothing perfect and on the other hand there's a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God and in as much as it was without, not without an oath for indeed, for they indeed became priests without an oath. But he with an oath said, through the one who said it to him, Yahuwah has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Hallelujah. So much more also, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. The former priests, on, the, on one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were present, prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds the priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. We can't reach the Father without the Son. It's only through the sacrifice that he made. And so this is, you know, just, just a comparison with the, of the priesthoods. Here in chapter 7 of Hebrews, the Levitical priesthood, their earthly priests who make atonement for sins, but, but uh, in that system, in the Old Covenant, we can't be made right with God through our, through our obedience because none of us are perfect. But Jesus made it to where he lived the perfect life for us. Then we turn to him. We believe in him. And we have that righteousness imputed to us. We receive his righteousness through faith. And that's a new covenant. And as far as the law, the law isn't done away with. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 4, sin is lawlessness. Transgression of the law is sin. Breaking the law, breaking God's commandments is what defines sin. And we can't live in sin. The Bible says in uh, the book of Revelation and in the writings of Paul, if we live a sinful lifestyle, we won't end up in the kingdom of God. We'll end up in the lake of fire. 
So our obedience to the law is still very important. But it's not our obedience to the law that can save us. Because none of us are perfect. But Jesus was perfect. And it's through him that we receive eternal life. But once we come to him, we have to follow him. We have to keep his commandments fully. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those priests, to offer up sacrifices, no daily sacrifices, for his own. First for his own sins and then for the sins of the people because with the, the high priest or the priest would have to make sacrifices for their own sins and then for the sins of the people. But he had no sin. And he made a sacrifice for us for all time. See, he is the high priest and he was also the sacrifice. He's both. He's everything. He's the high priest and he was also the sacrifice and offered up his own blood on the altar for, for our sins for all time. So once we turn to Him and truly have faith in Him, as long as we hold on to that faith and don't rebel against Him and just completely live a sinful lifestyle, we're going to be with Him in His kingdom. We're going to receive eternal life. But we need to be careful to truly follow Him. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Because this he did for because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law, appoints a son, made perfect forever. Hallelujah. And based on how long that study took, uh, we might only go through a couple chapters in this one and, do, and finish up in another uh, study. I'm thinking Hebrews 7 through 9, so maybe in the next two chapters. We'll see. Hebrews chapter 8. And you know what? Let's see. Give me a second. Phone doesn't want to work right right now. Let's see. This is, uh, I'm going to play a quick song and I'll be right back. Um, I'll be right back to finish the rest of the study. <clears throat> this is the first song of my first project. There was an intro prayer, and this is the first song of my first music project. And we'll finish the video here in a second. Thanks to Jesus and his 
found that they're forgiven and forgiven. I changed the way I'm living. Try to stay far away from sinning. Far away. I hope when I make these songs, guys up there grinning, up there grinning. I'm trying to help bring back his children. From the evils in the way that they've been living. No, I'm being gangsta, but that ain't slowing me. Satan's on the prowl, but he ain't holding me. Feel like I got the knowledge of an older me. Every day I pray. The God is close to me every day. I learn about God and follow commandments. Follow commandments. I don't care if you're black, white, or you're Spanish. Or you're Spanish. Go through Jesus or from heaven, you'll be banished. Banished. And have to go through destruction of this planet. In my life, Lord, I've done a lot of wrong. A lot of wrong. Please forgive me, please forgive me for my wrong. For my wrong. I had to put it in words upon this song. On this song. I pray I touch people with words of my song. In my song. In my life, Lord, I've done a lot of wrong. All right, let's get into Hebrews chapter 8. Now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest. Uh, speaking about Jesus. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Hallelujah. A minister in the sanctuary. And in the true tabernacle, which the, which, the, which the Lord pitched, not man. And so, the tabernacle that we've been studying in Leviticus and Exodus was just a picture of the heavenly tabernacle. So, Moses was told to make the earthly, just like he saw in his vision of the, te of the heavenly tabernacle. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to, to erect the tabernacle, for see, he says, and this is what I was just speaking about, for see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, by as much as he also is the mediator of a better covenant, which has which has been enacted on better promises. Promise of eternal life. For if that first covenant had been faultless, and there is no fault in God, we know there is no fault in God. There is no fault in any of His plans. So it's not the first covenant. Well, I'll, I'll just say this: the way the first covenant is it isn't faultless. The way there, the way the way the way there's fault in the first covenant is not because of God. It has nothing to do with God or how He made the covenant. It's because of us. Because we can't keep it perfectly. We can't keep God's commandments perfectly. So. There's a, now there's a new covenant. If that first covenant had been faultless, there would not have been, there would have been no occasion sought for a second, for finding fault with them. Speaking about us or the, the Israelites more specifically, for finding fault with them, not with the covenant, not with him, not with his part of the agreement, but with our part of the agreement, for finding fault with them, he says. Behold, days are coming, says Yahuwah, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the, out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue with my covenant. And I did not care for them, says Yahuwah, for this is the covenant, and it was because of them, because they didn't continue in his covenant. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahuwah. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And so, in a way, this is done through the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit reminds us to keep God's commandments, reminds us to follow Him and do what's right. But I believe we're not, I don't believe we're fully in, in the new covenant yet. And not that none of us are in the new covenant, us as believers are in it, are in the new covenant. We are in this new agreement with God. But in saying that, you know, if we go back to the old covenant, God referred to Israel as his wife. And then once Israel was split up, there was the northern house of Israel, the southern house of Judah. The Bible says God divorced Israel but didn't divorce Judah, meaning a marriage, it's the, a marriage relationship. And in the same way, us in a new covenant, we're not in that marriage relationship yet until we're transformed into our new bodies and brought into his kingdom, into the new uh, Israel, into the, par into the paradise of God, into uh, his kingdom, the new Jerusalem. We're basically currently engaged or engaged to him right now, but we're not fully in the new covenant yet. And we won't, the fully, I mean, the new covenant won't be fully complete until after the thousand year reign of Christ because there's still going to be sinners during that time. There's still going to be people coming to faith during that time, still joining the covenant. So it's not going to be complete until after that. For this is the covenant that, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahuwah. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen, and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all will know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. So, this isn't the case yet. We're still out here saying know the Lord. We're all out here saying, believe in Jesus. Jesus loves you. And people don't know the Lord. We're not fully in, in the new covenant yet. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother saying, know the Lord or know Yahuwah. For all will know me. Hallelujah. <laughs> Imagine that day. For all will know me. From the least, from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be mercy. I will be merciful for I will be merciful to their iniquities or sins. Hallelujah. And I will remember I will remember their sins no more. Hallelujah. When he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but not yet, as we read in the next sentence. But whatever whatever is becoming obsolete and is growing old is ready to disappear. So it hasn't disappeared yet. The, the new covenant is still in I mean the old covenant is still in place. But, you know, it's not gone yet. We're not... Well, you know... Let me just hold, hold off on saying more, more concerning this right now. Because the Bible said, says God didn't divorce Judah. But then in 70 AD, he did divorce them, basically. He, he kicked them out of the land, uh, scattered them. Because they rejected the Messiah. And to be joined back in covenant with God has got to be through the new covenant, not the old. It's got to be through this new agreement that is through faith in the Melchizedek priest, Jesus, rather than uh, earthly Levitical priesthood. And so again, we're not fully in, in the new covenant yet, but... Uh, we're not necessarily out of... I'll just say the... I'll just read this last line one more time and I'll just leave it at that for right now. It says, When he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. So, at this point, you know, and this was after Christ says becoming old and ready to disappear it didn't yet chapter 9 now even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship in earthly in the earthly sanctuary for there was a tabernacle prepared and let me just open up this this book here to 
show the visuals of what we're talking about. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were the lampstand, the table, and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. So here's the tabernacle. Here's the tabernacle. So it's the outer one, which is contains the lampstand, the table, and the bread. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one. In which were the lampstand, table, and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil was a tabernacle called the holy of holies. And that's what we see right here. Behind that second veil. Right here, that veil. Behind the second veil was a tabernacle in which is called the Holy of Holies. Having a golden altar of incense, which is right there, which is actually on the other side of the veil. Unless, unless this picture is wrong and it's supposed to be on the inside, I thought it was on the outside. Having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of, Covenant, Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides. But it says... It does say, say in this word here that the that the altar of incense was in the Holy of Holies. Again, let me just read this one more time. It says, uh, Behind the second veil there was a tabernacle which is called the Holy of Holies. Having a golden altar of incense in the Holy of Holies. And the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold. And there, so there was another scripture that mentioned um, offering the the incense on the altar and it going up before the mercy seat. I'm gonna have to go back into Leviticus and Exodus and see if it's specifically mentioned as outside the holy of holies, because here in Hebrews chapter nine it says it's inside the holy of holies, and there was that other scripture that said. Uh, the incense was burned and went up before God. So, so let me just continue on with the study. I'm going to check that out a little bit more later. Behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was, in which. So in, in the Ark of the Covenant, there was the mercy seat. That's basically the lid that covered it. But inside the Ark of the Covenant, it says... In which was a golden jar holding the manna. So God told Israel to set aside some of the manna. And we haven't... Uh, actually, we have gotten to this in Exodus. Um, to set aside some of the manna, put it in a jar for future generations to see as a te as a testimony of what God did for them. And it's believed that still exists. And if we go to the book of Revelation, um, when it's speaking about the seven churches, one of them it says, I will give to you to eat of the of the hidden manna. And I believe this may be the leftover manna from back then that's still good and God is going to multiply and give it to us which is you know amazing so behind the second veil there was a tabernacle which is called the holy of holies having a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant called, covered on all sides with gold in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod which budded so Aaron's rod which budded and we also see this in another uh, scripture and I believe it's uh, in the story of um, the story of Korah if I remember right but it was like an almond almond uh, rod and, bud and it budded it said in Aaron's rod which budded 
after it was already off the tree, already disconnected from the source, it still budded. That's, you know, that's a miracle. And Aaron's rod which budded, and the tables of the covenant, which is the, the Ten Commandments. So this, Aaron's rod, the, the jar of the manna, and the Ten Commandments were inside the Ark of the Covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot speak, we cannot now speak in detail. Speaking about, uh, no. The Ark of the Covenant. And... One second. Now when these things have been so prepared, the priests continually enter the outer tabernacle, outer, outer tabernacle, which is this whole, this whole place, this whole, with the fence around it. Well, actually, no, this whole place here, not just the, the tabernacle there, but uh, I believe this is what it's speaking about, or maybe, maybe it's just speaking about the tabernacle. Yeah, so it's my, my fault. Uh, it's actually speaking about the tabernacle. The tabernacle which has the holy place and then the most holy place. It says, Now when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, the holy the holy place, perform, performing the divine worship. But into the second, into the holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant is, but into the second only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is this, which is the symbol, which is a symbol for the present time. So, at that time. So the way into the holy place, into the presence of God, while while they were still in the old covenant, while the, while they were still um, performing the priestly duties, the earthly priestly, priestly duties, it says the Holy Spirit is signifying this that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. Since they relate only to food and drink and various washings and regulations for the body, body imposed until a time of reformation. Again, the, the offerings, the sacrifices can't make us perfect and can't make our, our heart perfect, can't make our soul pure, can't make our spirit pure perfect conscience but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is to say not of this creation and not through the blood of goats and calves but through his own blood he entered the holy places speaking about the heavenly tabernacle he, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifer sprinkled, sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ through the, through the eternal spirit, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And it's the Holy Spirit, you know, God... He changes us. He gives us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit leads us to be obedient. Cleanses us from dead works. For this reason, He is the mediator of a new covenant. So that since a death has taken place for the redemption of transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, 
those who have been called may receive the promise of the internal of the eternal inheritance so again it's the first covenant it says a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions or sins committed under the first covenant so we are still technically in the in the old covenant we still sin and it's because of our sins that we are appointed we are appointed to death but once we come to faith whoever doesn't believe is technically in the old covenant um but once we come to faith, we are introduced in, into the new covenant and the blood of Jesus washes us. But that doesn't mean that the law from the old covenant doesn't still apply for us today. Because the law is what defines sin. The law, what, see, see, once we come to faith, we're in a new covenant. But the law still applies. What, the part of the law that doesn't apply to us once we come into the new covenant, and this is what Paul spoke about the whole time, about not being under the law. The part, I mean, at least a lot of what he spoke about concerning not being under the law. The law that we're not under, it's not the commandments of God that we have to keep as obedience to God, but it's the punishment that comes from breaking the commandments of God. That's the law of sin and death. Once we sin, that our sin results in death, and so sometimes when Paul is speak, what says law, he's speaking about the law of sin and death. And it's that. That's, uh, let me just read this scripture here again. It says, for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. So that since a death has taken place for the redemption of transgressions or sins that were committed under the first covenant. And that's all of us. All of our sins were committed under, under the first covenant, under the old covenant. And so this is the difference. Our sins are... So anyone who hasn't received forgiveness of sins through Christ, they're still under the punishment of that old covenant. Under the, the punishment of the law of the old covenant. Now in a new covenant, that punishment of the law... Is taken away. See, there's still a transfer of law. It's not a change in law, but it's transfer of law. So it's still the same law. But what doesn't, what is removed in the new covenant, what is removed in Christ, is the punishment for breaking that law, which is death in a lake of fire. So once we come to faith, that death is taken away from us, and we receive eternal life. But we have to continue in our in our faith. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since the death, since a death has taken place for the redemption, speaking about himself, Jesus died for the redemption of the sins that were committed under the first covenant, which is all of our sins. But once we come to faith, we're in the new covenant. Not fully in the new covenant yet, but we are about to be joined to him in the new covenant. But our sins are cleansed, and the law that is removed isn't the commandments that we're supposed to keep, but it's the punishment for breaking the commandments that we're supposed to keep. It's the punishment for sin that is removed from us. It's that death and the lake of fire that is removed from us, which is the punishment for breaking a law. When the law says, when you commit this act or commit that act, uh, the punishment is death. That death is taken away from us. So through Him, through Jesus... That punishment is taken away from us. And once we come to faith in Him, we enter we enter into the new covenant. But, but like I said, we're not fully in the new covenant yet. We're basically engaged to God, not married yet. But we have to continue in our faith. We, we have to continue in our faithfulness to Him by keeping His commandments. That's how we're faithful to Him, by obeying Him, by keeping His commandments, which are the same commandments from the Old Testament. But as we've been speaking about through... The studies in Exodus and Leviticus, and we'll continue on through Numbers and Deuteronomy. Um, not everything applies to us right now, but we need to obey God to the best of our ability for what does apply to us, and much of it does apply to us. So, 
You know, we need to follow God. We need to keep His commandments. The breaking of His commandments results in death through Christ. That death is taken away from us and we receive eternal life and enter His, enter His covenant. And that law that is taken away from us isn't the commands that we're supposed to follow, but the commands that that are that are the punishment commands, the, the commands that are meant to happen as a result of us breaking His commands. <laughs> the punishment uh, for breaking the law, that those are the commands that no longer apply to us. That part of the law, the punishment of the law, the curse of the law, the law of sin and death is what no longer applies to us. Now, let's continue on through the chapter one more time here. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of sins that were committed, or transgressions, because it's transgression of the law. And that's what sin is. For the redemption of transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the inter eternal inheritance through Him and only through Him because none of us are perfect. And this is what this whole study has been about. None of us are perfect. But Jesus came and ministered for us as an eternal high priest. And He died for us so that through this new covenant we can receive eternal life. One more time for the so for this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant so so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions of the law that were committed under the first covenant those who have been called may receive the promise of an eternal eternal inheritance hallelujah for where a covenant in for where a covenant is there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it for a covenant is valid only when men are dead. For it is never enforced while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and the goats with the water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you and in the same way he sprinkled both the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry with the blood and according to the law one may also say that all things are cleansed with blood and without shedding of blood there is no forgiveness therefore it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens again so the earthly <laughs> So the earthly tabernacle and all everything regarding to this, um, that's the earthly representation of the heavenly. The earthly is the old covenant. The heavenly is the new covenant. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of these things in the heavens to be cleansed with the cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands but a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself, and again, so the high priest would go in into the Holy of Holies once a year. And in the heavenly, the Ark of the Covenant re represents the throne of God. So Jesus, after he, after he was the sacrifice himself, him, himself was a sacrifice but he was also the high priest and brought his own blood into heaven and so this re represents we spoke about this in Exodus 40 if you haven't seen the Exodus 40 Bible study go check it out bit.ly slash Larry Newport but the outer tabernacle represents well technically the outer court represents earth and the tabernacle represents heaven and in the new covenant there the veil is ripped there is no veil here and we are able to come go right before god but as jesus the high priest would come in here once a year to make atonement for sins but jesus in the heavenlies went before the father to make atonement for our sins and this is what we're reading about right here 
It says, For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor, what, nor was it that he would offer himself often, often, as the high priest, high priest enters the holy place year by year with the blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would needed to have suffered. He would need. He would have had. He would have needed to suffer since the foundation of the world. But now, once. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Inasmuch. As it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin for those who eagerly await him. One more time. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him hallelujah that's the end of chapter 9 and that's where we're going to where we're going to stop for this study one more time so Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of many instead of offered many times the high priest would make offerings year by year but Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Let's eagerly await him. Let's look to the sky. He said, when you see all these things happening, which are happening now, look up for your redemption draws near. Our redemption is near. We need to be prepared for the coming of the Lord. We need to be ready to be brought into his tabernacle into his house the heavenly reality of this and it will happen we just need to make sure we're ready we need to be right with him let's walk in all the ways of God let's serve him with all our heart let's make sure there's nothing holding us back from the kingdom let's shine his light and let's show his love in everything we do let's be right with him let's make sure we have a pure heart let's follow God in everything and if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, turn to him. The Old Testament, the tabernacle and all that, that was all that was a foreshadowing of the heavenly reality. God had the Israelites perform a, a earthly uh, representation of the heavenly reality. And the heavenly reality was fi fulfilled when Jesus 2,000 years ago came born as a human. And died on the cross for our sins. The unblemished lamb. The blameless, pure, unblemished lamb of God. Who died for the sins of the world. And he offered up himself in the heavenly tabernacle. To make atonement to the Father for us. So that through him we receive eternal life. And are able to dwell with God in his kingdom forever. Our sins are forgiven. Repent and believe the gospel. Give your life to Jesus today. There's not much time left. Now that's the end of the study here in the book of Hebrews. Thank you guys for tuning in. Hallelujah. All glory to God. Love y'all. Shalom.